that is that is one of the greatest yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, James James Morrow. Uh, Hello. 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 Hello.
don't write in terms of something that you think you should be able to understand, it also sort of says, you know, if you're good, then you can make your kids good, even if it's applied to people, you know, that was good. Darwin's biggest thing, I mean, he said a lot of things, you know, but the thing that really got people was when he said, you know, he said, okay, so there's one variation. Okay, we understand that. And uh, things change. Well, we can sort of understand that. We did a half of the whole first beginning about the origin of species and talking about like dogs and farm animals and pigeons and stuff like that. He was writing for the you know squire scientists, farmers out there who were doing this naturally. It's like, too cool, we understand that. And he kept saying things one after the other. And then at the end, he sort of said, oh, and we can kind of apply this to people too. And the shit hit the fan, you know, in a big way. So I really think a lot of it is even you know the whole. Uh, it wasn't so much the change in, in uh, evolution that was the biggest problem. It was the uh, uh, common ancestry, you know, the certain modification kind of thing, that more than the process he was talking about. That just, that just uh, there are some of interesting articles in the Carl as a figure who stood four square against the slavery. Yes. yes that and is. and uh, it's certainly not remotely inherent in his argument that we can, we can extrapolate talk about the status quo as being therefore natural for the political status quo, where it's sort of a major kind of category error. Uh, another point I'd like to make in relative to social Darwinism is that if social Darwinism, Darwinism actually antedates Darwin, it was very much on the table, uh, particularly in the form of the essay that so influenced Darwin, actually it's a book called, it's called Essay on Population. That's when you first encounter sort of this ugly idea that uh, we should not help the poor because they'll just go out and make more work. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to fall apart it's anyway. It's quite a tough love. But none of that is biology. So that's my contribution. Steve. Well, the, um, the issues of, the, the big issue for evolution is that it included humans. It took us out of it. It basically completed the Copernican revolution pulling us out of the center. Finally, we're not even in the center of biology, and it applies to us, too. I mean, Alfred Wallace had real trouble uh, applying it ultimately rejected it as far as human beings were concerned. So this is, you know, way predates any of this. And, and Darwin wasn't immediately accepted for quite a while. Um, it wasn't until Mendel was rediscovered in the early uh, 20th century, 1905, when they started pulling the what we now the view as a modern synthesis together, started pulling together then. And that was, what, 50 years after uh, Origin of Species was first published? It was 1859? What's fascinating um, is, I didn't realize this until I read recently this book, uh, Relics of Eden. And I can't remember the author, he's a professor in uh, the of Utah. And he was going over Mendel's papers. And it's apparent, apparently, Mendel was aware of the relevance of his work for Darwin. In other words, he read Darwin. I always thought he was doing it in isolation, but yeah. he, he knew that what he was doing was going to have relevance for uh, evolution. He was tending his pea plants. Tending his pea plants. Right. That Austrian was it? But, but he knew he knew this was something. Is there any evidence that he tried, that, that it made it very nervous, therefore, and did some awful things? Oh, yeah. I mean, he, yeah, his superiors were definitely uh, nervous. I mean, they didn't burn his work or anything like that, but it, it was definitely kind of a bit of an awful It's not surprising. I mean, Darwin, you know, didn't publish his work forever, you know, and, and had you know, understanding of it was, was pretty well fleshed out long before he was forced to publication, partially because he was able to get the chain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was only kind of professional pride, I guess, on Wallace that did his public thing. Oh, that was very nice the way they worked it out. I thought that was nice. They probably made the joint paper. They both got joint credit for it. Wallace never had any particular... I thought that was great. Yeah, but science. they wouldn't publish at that point unless Wallace had shown up and his friends would have said, listen, you're going to get something out of there. Otherwise, right. nobody's going to remember your name. He's trying to earn a living without sending specimens back. Okay. It's, it's interesting that I, I, I wouldn't, uh, far be it for me to see you know, a Stephen King quote, who I admire very much, but I, I wonder if he isn't sort of dodging the, the aspect of evolutionary theory that Gould insisted on. I mean, yes, you could say it made people nervous because it seemed to partake of this kind of social darkness, and maybe that's why people objected. And then there's the argument that, um, you know, that Darwin is. Uh, a hero of mine, it's hard to write a novel about him, I find, because he had this great adventure going around the world. He came home and then nothing happened. 
20 years. <laughs> Nothing happened. Because one of these chat around sort of. Sit around looking, and looking and at earthworms <laughs> and collecting yeah, so orchids. <laughs> and, you know, uh, and it's very so much more. <laughs> Thin edge of the wedge. 
they are uh, attempting to do a physical re-explanation of light years to show that we have a young universe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, stellar that stellar systems can be produced in ten thousand years. Right. Okay. Uh, it's you know we're we're talking about much now. Now carbon future. dating is completely wrong. We're talking about an alternate yeah. universe here. I mean, are mythological they, universe. Mythological, mythological or something. You know, Terry Pratchett-esque uh, disc world uh, sort of universe. Uh, the reason I, I brought up Steve Jack Google earlier is I think I think the other piece of why I'm so nervous. Uh, yeah, Google insisted on the, the really strong form of just the non-teleology. There's absolutely no nothing you can say that that's progressive. Yeah, right. And, and, you, and you want to take, you know, and then you're left with, oh, so there's no meaning. Yeah, it's and, then, and then the world bifurcates into people who say, there's no meaning. Great, we make our own meaning. And then other people say, that's the worst news I ever heard. In fact, I don't want to hear it. Yeah, we're not yeah. talking about the truth. <laughs> and, 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 no that, and then this chasm yeah. opens up. The world belongs to the criteria. The, the, the problem of teleology is there a purpose? Is there is there a guide? Going is this going to a particular idea? Or is it what? And, and, yeah. Yeah. and the, the other, it really bothers the other hunch I have, uh, I don't see this articulated before, is that, and maybe, <laughs> possibly because he's Jewish, but I'm not sure, maybe Stephen Poole wasn't empathizing with how hard it is for Christians to think this through, because what is the whole this world? What is the whole meaning of the incarnation? It's that the Garden of Eden is being redeemed. The fall of Adam, this primal lapse, that monstrous cosmic debt is finally being paid off by the, by the, the coming of the Christ in the fullness of time. If there was no Garden of Eden, if there was no Adam, if there was no primal sin, that problematizes the entire Christian argument. Yeah, or, you know, you know for, for a certain kind of theological discussion. Yeah, you create the sin and then you save yourself from it. Hey, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird, uh, th yeah, there's a lot of, of hang-ups. I mean, I wonder if, I was talking with somebody in the halls and we're walking along and I'm wondering about Richard, is Richard Dawkins doing more harm than good? Is it, he is an evangelical atheist. <laughs> there's no other, no fairer way to describe him. Does anybody see his uh, TED talk? You know what ten? Oh, yeah. Okay. After this thing, everybody gets up, walks to the internet, <laughs> www.ted.com. Look up Dawson's one. But yeah. it is yeah. the, all these people were talking about get props every year at Ted, and they they're brilliant. But anyway, it's all Ted. Uh, it's technology, entertainment, design. Ted. Oh. Um, anyway, Dawkins had made an interesting point about this. He said essentially that uh, it was two thousand. It was uh, nine eleven that made him change his mind and because he was tired of being tolerant of fundamentalists. And he felt that 9-11 felt that that event was a, a fundamentalist <coughs> terrorist act he was not very tolerant. The thing is that Darwin himself was actually a fairly religious man. He had a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, soul searching that he was doing and he was working on this, his whole uh, uh, office and uh, he, well, came to, he, he managed to make peace with it. Well, I, I think I think for Darwin there were unequivocal atheist implications. He was not happy about that, he was still pointing out. That's, that's why he temporized so much uh, over, over going public with this. You know, his daughter's like, what, uh, yes, yes, he was the death of a man. Pretty much convinced him that, that, that was wrong. There, was no, there was no God looking out for people. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was hard on him on, on his marriage. Yes. Uh, mm. his, his, his wife was once a, a very serious Unitarian, Unitarian, which in England in those days, it was the, uh, not the uh, uh, Jews would, uh, before they joined the yeah, Unitarians would have seminars. What did it mean? Uh, it was very salvationist. You signed up for Jesus and lived forever. The thought that she was not be with Charles and she loved you. She would not be with him. In turn, it becomes a great anger. One of her to publish it after she left.
left her some money to help us in the version of the had in 1944. Sort of a You raised an interesting question about the dogs doing more harm than good. And I'm thinking of it from a kind of scientific point of view. There's, there's this whole kind of discussion about uh, between scientists who think, well, is it mostly natural selection or is it mostly genetic drift and variation? And one of my favorites, yeah. I just want to Larry Morrow up at the University of Toronto. He loves kind of like, Dawkins irritates him because he feels, thinks Dawkins is a little too much of an adaptation, is too much natural selection, and we're neglecting, you know, uh, the variation of the genetic drift that's going on and uh, too much emphasis uh, on um, uh, changes in the environment and uh, uh, allopathic species and things like that, which I find really fascinating. I think one of the people that pisses people off. Oh, yeah. 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 Gould is one of those people that. Oh, and he and Dawkins yeah. were like. Yeah, yeah. Gould yeah. yeah. the was cool not good. impressed with. Uh, Gould had a, he had rather large, had a fair amount of ego. Punctuated equilibrium. No. Yeah. Right. This is, you know, what's fascinating about this is when you actually, you know, I, I, I kind of read these guys being creationists. Right wing pundits. I mean, you know, you got to keep an eye on them. Um, but uh, it's interesting because they don't understand science. Right, right. It's really fascinating. Science is rough, science is bloody. These guys, you know, tear apart each other's whole structures every day. Uh, I, I have a good friend of mine who I only refer because it's a little nasty. Uh, tore apart uh, a gentleman down in Jersey's research that he had based the last 20 years of his NIH grants on. And she ripped out from underneath him the entire basis for his work. So he's now floundering, looking for grants. You know, this happens all the time. I mean, she takes that successfully on the merits. Of oh, absolutely. Yeah. She didn't do it. I mean, these guys are not doing it from first of all, there's some personality. These are, these are humans. But, but, but they're doing it based on the ideas of merit. And you listen to read the creationists. They get all pissed off. Like, oh, you're challenging my ideas. Well, duh. <laughs> you know, you want to get it? We're playing this arena. Pull out your knife. Oh yeah! It's really about because it's like red and tooth and claw. It's all about stabbing each other at the back and swiping ideas, and it's like uh, you know 150 pages worth of suspense. It reads like an espionage novel, and then like you know how it's going to end, kind of thing. But this is sort of how it gets there. Oh, and there this was, is real science, and yeah. now it really works. It and when, when really Pauline comes up with an idea for the, the and, and the, the, oh, it's wrong! Oh boy, it's wrong! <laughs> Yeah, let's I know that's 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 I
And one of the things Darwin did study was breeding of animals in uh, variation. If you look at dogs, there's a tremendous variation. If you look, at, if you look at pigeons, uh, we don't consider dogs to speciate. Well, yeah, they, they do. They do. But if you look, if you look at dinosaurs, for example, and I, I mean, I, I, one of the things that I cover right about a lot is paleontology, and I've been following the whole discovery of the feathered dinosaurs in China. And if you look at this, you know, what, what I began to ask myself is to what extent is there a range, range like modern dogs that have somehow diverged and they're not quite, not fully separated yet. Because you start seeing traits that appear in one little group over here that doesn't, you know, obviously a non-flyer, and they have, there's nothing, this, but in some of the flyers have it, right. but it's not enough, and not in others. Yeah, some I think the dogs will eat it. Okay, if you were going to attempt to crossbreed something like a Great Dane and Chihuahua, would they produce, say, viable, <laughs> would they produce, quote, unquote, viable offspring? Right. They, 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 they can't. can't. <laughs> they can't get together. I don't think yeah. they can. <laughs>
the articles I read in the last week or two uh, that suggest that uh, Darwin knew that this was a big area. Yeah, he left it big on purpose. Lots of weird ideas. There was something in the blood that he thought was always. Oh, yeah, the inheritance of the inheritance of the or whatever they're called. But, you know, look at Blyman. That's <laughs> what he's he, he, yeah. But I put I uh, Daniel Dennett down the street. I was first that wonderful book called Darwin's Dangerous Idea. He said, you know, if I had to pick a candidate for the single most beautiful idea anybody ever came up with, it would be you know, evolution by nature of natural selection. And it's, it's been like uh, um, Daniel Dennett used the metaphor of universal acid. It just eats, it's moving through everything it really that its enemies have been able to throw out. Of, um, and, and this conversation we're having about what is the species, it's still, you know, what remains standing is that everything that whether you want to call it a web or a bush or a tree, everything can, almost certainly, with a primordial. There's some of us, even that the biochemists that may have actually functioned under selective issues yeah. to create original life. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but it's it probably had just because, you know, you know and what a, what a miraculous insight that looks at everything, everything's connected at the most material level.
Because it's actually, it turns out that it actually takes significant cost to make the adaptation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, if, if you lose a pathway, we've, in fact, there's uh, one evidence I wrote it down. I can't. And oh, my MY816. Um, it's a gene that produces a muscular protein that is uh, found in chimps, found in most primates, it's inactive in humans. It's only used in chimps in muscles of the head, usually around the chewing apparatus. I believe it's also found in gorillas. Some speculation, pure speculation, is that the relaxation of the muscles around the head allowed the opportunity for further growth of the skull outside of so if we learn to shut up, our brains will grow more. Speech, I have another fascinating fact for evolution. Fox B2. Fox B2 is shown, actually, it's, uh, it's used in language, bird songs, and echolocation. Okay? If you knock it out, human beings lose the power of making sense of or making speech. Okay? It's also found in Neanderthals. I hope that. Actually, I think I can the beak of the pitch. I think I can the beak of the pitch. Uh, yeah. I thought it was fascinating because uh, essentially speciation occurred under this study, this is in Latinus, um, where it, it was demonstrated that speciation occurred during uh, periods of drought and changes yeah. in the environment. Turned out to be highly mobile. The basis of the size of the seed. Right. Mm -hmm. The seeds changed, the beaks changed. Yeah, yeah, it turned out that the, beak, um, the beaks and finches were highly mobile, the, the genetics of the, of the beak. Yeah. Right, so uh, suddenly you had. Masses of these types of fish with masses of those types of features. And that's been absolutely your kind of just coming to Is there another panel after this one? There is. Yeah. Oh. Yay, darling.